Well, guys, good afternoon. How are you doing? Good evening. Hey, Professor, we're doing good. Um, professor, just a quick okay. question. Did you ever get an email from me? Mm, yeah, I think I replied to you, Kevin. I'm not sure. You didn't? Yes. Yeah. Can you send me send, send the email again so I can take a look? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sure. Professor? Uh, yep. I, had to, I just had a quick question about uh, quiz three and four. So, like, what time and date exactly would they be? Uh... Yeah, the the let me admit everything. You you know what? Better talk about this at the end of the class. So I am sure that everyone is here. So I don't repeat. Okay, okay. sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, guys, let's continue moving. <clears throat> Uh, what we have done, guys, in a, in the previous class was bar models. Okay, so just to to remember what we have done, bar p model. So this is a multivariate model, and remember that with a bar model, one of the main conditions is that every every single series must be stationary. Okay, so a stationarity condition is crucial. Uh, and what is stationarity? Basically, what we have seen is weekly stationarity or a, a strict stationarity, but we are looking for a stationarity. So the series must more or less should look like, like this, okay? So this implies, guys, that we can work in, in terms of financial data. We can work, for example, with log returns or, or simple returns. So returns look like, like this one here, okay? And, and this is true also, guys, for ARMA, PQ models, so the univariate models and also true for garch type models. Okay. So all of them require stationarity. So this implies that we can work in this uh, under this data. Right? However, uh, as I was explaining on the, on the YouTube video, there is a lot of information that you can get just by analyzing the data. So normal returns are first difference, you agree? Just by analyzing the data in, in levels, okay? So this one here is, of course, non-stationary. And the thing is that, can we have some, some information here that can be useful for us? And that's the question of a co-integration. Okay. So what is co-integration, guys? Co-integration is simply a long-term relationship. And what is very important for you to understand is that, that this, this long-term relationship comes, comes from theory, guys, okay? It comes from knowledge of what you are talking about. So imagine that I provide you, okay, this data, okay, I'm, I'm just creating this data randomly. So this is, imagine this is Y and this is X, okay? If you run y on x, so if you just do a, a simple linear regression of y on x, how do you think it's going to be your R square? How do you think it's going to be your coefficients that the parameters are going to, to be significant or not significant? How do you imagine your model is going to, to be? A very simple model. So imagine y equals alpha plus beta x plus my error. So how do you think the, the model is, gonna, is going to be? Y on x. It would probably say they have a, uh, a they do have a relationship. Yeah. Like the R square will be good. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to have beautiful R squares, and most likely beta is going to be statistically significant. Okay. That's the risk that we have when we have when we are using data that is non-stationary, guys. This can be just just imagine. I think I put uh, I, I I did an example rain in Peru. And this one here can simply be, you know what, uh, stock prices of Amazon. So they can be completely unrelated. And just because they are trending more or less the same, the, the regression is going to be beautiful. However, guys, this is completely meaningless. Do you agree? So this is what is called a spurious regression. Okay, so this one and this one here, this is called what is, what is called a spurious regression. So what is this previous regression, guys, is that just because they trend more or less similarly, we can get beautiful R squares, beautiful betas, but they are meaningless. They, they, they mean nothing. 
Okay? That's one of the risks when you have this type of non-stationary data. So remember guys that the OLS does not require stationarity. So for applying OLS on this data, this is okay. But what you need to be very careful is careful on what you're regressing, okay? So you need to have intuition on what's, what's going on. In the YouTube video, guys, I presented you a couple of theoretical ideas, you know, option prices versus that versus the underlying. So if I'm doing an option on Amazon, I believe the price of the option should be related, must be related, in, at least in the long term, with the price of the underlying, okay? Spot price versus future price. Of course, if we're talking about the same financial instrument, even though they have some discrepancies in the short term, so that's why traders exist. In the short term, they in the sorry, in the long term, they they must be related somewhat or somehow. Okay. So the first thing you need to remember, integration is, is a beautiful technique, as, as you're gonna see in a minute. But you need to be extremely careful that you are not, not working with spurious regressions. Okay. So you need to have some theory in the back that tells you, you know what, there is some relationship, long-term relationship between these guys. Well, and, and the, the full idea of cointegration, guys, was, was developed in the following idea. So imagine that I have yt equals alpha plus beta 1x1 one t plus beta 2x2 two two t plus my error. Okay. And now assume, and remember in the, I, what is the meaning of this I1? Any, someone remembers this? Have you watched the video? So what is I1? It's integrated of degree one, right? So this is a non these are non-stationary series. All of them are non-stationary series. Okay, and how many number of differentiate, how many, dif how many times you need to differentiate these series to become them I0? Once. Once, exactly. Non-stationary, and if you take the, if you differentiate once, so they become I0, and I0 is what we call stationary. Okay, so in general, guys, the, the, the general rule is that if you combine, you know, series that are I1, okay, the linear combination of this series is also going to be an I1, right? Okay? And in general, if we have, if we combine, for example, one I2 with one I1 with one I3, the linear combination is going to be I maximum of the of the degrees of integration of the well, integration or differentiation. However, there is one particular case, guys, and this is the, the, the full idea of cointegration. What I will do is I will move all the all the elements on the left hand side and we just in the right hand side and we just leave a mu or u minus beta one x one t minus beta two x two t equals mu t. Okay, so this one is like, like having a one on front. Okay, so what the idea is if there is a, a, a vector that I will call one minus one minus one, I'm ah, sorry, minus, sorry, minus alpha minus beta one minus beta two. So this is my cointegrate, my, my vector. If, I, if I'm able to find one vector, one minus alpha, one minus beta, one minus beta, so this is, this is comma, right? minus beta two, in such a way that this guy here becomes I zero. So this vector here is gonna be called now cointegrating vector. That means, that there is a long-term relationship between the series. Okay, so this means basically guys that they co-integrate. So they, they go to a, to a same common uh, long-term horizon or they move together in, in the long-term. Okay. So this is it, is cointegration is basically is trying to find alpha, beta, one, beta, two in such a way that my combination of a integrated one, normally we're gonna be working with integrated number one because that's what we find in finance, becomes an I zero. Make sense to you guys? Okay, so 
I, I, I'm struggling to understand that. Can yeah. you just repeat the concept and just explain it again? Yes. So basically what it means, if you have a series of I1s, okay, the resulting series, so in general, this one here, if this is non-stationary, 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 normally this one here is also going to be non-stationary. Right? So remember, non-stationary means simply that they explode. Do you remember that? It's non-stationarity. Or, or unit brute implies that if you are shocked once and then you never never come back again to the to the lead. So basically, a non-stationary process in finance is you know is useless. You, you cannot do anything with that. Mm -hmm. Right? However, if there is a linear combination, if you find mathematically, you know, uh, this, this vector here, basically you find what is the value of alpha, beta one and beta two that make this mu t become stationary. So what this implies simply is the following. Okay, you can have series that are completely integrated. So one go up, the other one go up, the other one go up. But the resulting of, of combining them creates a stationary series. Remember stationarity in, in finance guys is also called mean reversion. Do you remember that? So it means that if, if the system is shocked, we go up and then we suddenly, we go down to the, to the average, to the long-term average. So what is the idea of having a, an I0 at the end of the day, guys, is that simply that the system converges to something, right? And converges into something implies that the, the, the long term is common for all these series. So in, in cointegration words, this implies that we have a cointegrating vector that implies that we have a long-term relationship between the variables, okay? So how do, you, how do we use this concept here? Well, let's go. Let's do the following, just to remember. Do you remember if I have a, a if I have an integrated one series? What I need to do? Well, I what I can do is I simply take the difference, right? If y one, if one, if y t, x one t, x two t, these ones are integrated. One easy way to to use my var, my r, my etc is simply to take the difference of this one. You agree? So you take the difference and then you can transform them on yt, you transform this in change on xt, you transform this in change of x2t, and then the things are solved. You know that these ones here are going to be stationary. You agree with me, guys? And say, so you know that, for example, a model like this, It's also stationary, do you agree? So you can use all the techniques that we have used with this, with this model here, not a big issue. However, what is the problem with this model, guys? I, I, I did that on the, on the YouTube video. What is the, the main issue with this model? Guys. Uh, is, is it that it can only account for uh, like one Co-integration vector? No. No. At, at this point, remember, as soon as everyone is stationary, you don't need co-integration vectors here. Okay, co-integration comes in this in, in this space when you have I1s. In this case, guys, what is important to know is that there is no equilibrium. There is no long-term equilibrium. Okay, very quickly. So what is the definition in the economics, guys, of long-term equilibrium? It's basically the, the status quo, do you agree? is a point in which there is no variation of the variables. So in terms of econometrics, guys, this implies that in the long term, yt equals yt minus one equals yt minus two. The same happens with x1t equals x1t minus one equals x1t minus two, et cetera. Do you agree? This is the, the, the equilibrium condition. It's a situation in which nothing changes, correct? Now, what happens if you apply this one here? If yt, remember that this change on, change on yt is simply yt minus yt minus one. And the same happens with change on x1t, change on x2t. So what is the long-term, what is the long-term, what this model can tell us about the long-term? Nothing, because this part disappears, this part disappears, this part disappears, everything disappears. Do you agree? So the long term, according to this model, does not exist. Your model, this model here, is able only 
is able to produce only short-term relationships. Make sense? So you, you, you are not able to basically create, you're not able to, to, to say anything about the long term. You, you don't, cannot do it. It's basically nothing, zero. That's why co-integration comes handy. Okay. Let me, let me write out the model. And, and this model, guys, as you gonna see the details, is a, sorry, is error correction model. Is what is called the error correction model. Take a look to, to how the error correction model works. So I will copy again everything. Yt equals alpha plus beta one change on x one t plus beta two change on x two t. So up to here, everything is a um, short term. Do you agree? Everything here is I zero, so I can use my techniques, my usual techniques that we have been learning in class. However, what I will add is a beta three, and I will add y t minus one minus gamma minus okay, let's call it gamma zero, gamma one. Uh, x1 t minus 1 minus gamma 2 x2 t minus 1 uh, plus my error. Okay. So now, what is this part here? Do you see, guys, we have labels here, correct? These are variables in labels. Agree with me or not? So they are not changes. So now what happens? This, this, this part here is called the error correction. I will explain to you what. The, the, the vector 1, comma, minus gamma 0, comma, minus gamma 1, comma, minus gamma 2. This one here are, can be a co-integrating vector. I'm saying can be, guys, because we need to test that, okay? It's not always true. It's a co-integrating vector if basically we obtain an I0 later, but this is the name. And this one here is called the speed of adjustment. I will explain in a minute. Okay, so let's first take a look to the long-term equilibrium. So what is the long-term equilibrium in this model? This part here disappears. Okay, the constant can stay there if you want. This disappears, this disappears. At the end of the day, I end up having this part here. Do you agree? So at the end of the day, I can have, you know, alpha. So zero is going to be equal to alpha plus beta three y minus beta three gamma zero minus beta three gamma one x one minus beta three gamma two x two. Do you agree guys? And then from here, what you can say is you can uh, remove y. So y is going to be equal to minus alpha plus beta three gamma zero plus beta three uh, gamma one x one plus beta three gamma two x two. So this is my long term relationship, guys. And what you need to note is that I, I don't use the t anymore because this is equilibrium. I don't use the t here, so it doesn't change in equilibrium. So this is my long term equilibrium. Got it? So this model here, <clears throat> the beauty about this model here, guys, is that it allows you to capture short-term movements, short-term <clears throat> relationships, but also allows you to compute or to have a long-term equilibrium, right? Now, this long-term equilibrium, guys, exists if and only if this part here, this error correction here, becomes an I0, okay? Why this is true? For the following reason, just reason with me for a minute. This is I zero by construction. This is also an I zero. This is also an I zero. And if this part here 
is an I zero. So everything is I zero, do you agree guys? So I can use that the common techniques as usual. All my, my time series techniques work perfectly because I'm, I'm, I'm in the perfect uh, I zero world. This makes sense to you or not guys? That, that's the, the, the core of the model. The model is a mixture of differences, short-term and levels, long-term. Okay. Questions? No questions? Professor, I have a quick question. With yeah, the go ahead. Um, I think it's the, the bracket in the equation underneath error correction model, the one yep. where you say it's I zero. Yep. Okay. So on top of that, there's another bracket um, and you derive the co-integration vector from the top bracket. So what's mm -hmm. this, if the co-integration vector exists, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. If, no, sorry. You, you understand that this vector, that the vector here is called simply one that comes from here, mm -hmm. minus gamma zero, minus gamma one, minus gamma two. This is my, my vector, okay? This becomes, so it's simply a vector. If you just take a look to the numbers, a vector. Mm -hmm. It will become a co-integrating vector if the resulting number here is a nice here. Okay. Right? Now, how this, where this number comes from? Sorry, where this equation comes from? Well, take a look, guys. This, this comes from what we have done a couple of minutes ago. So this one here comes from a very simple regression analysis. Take a look. What I have is the only, the only thing that you need to be careful is that it's t minus 1. Okay, So I'm, I'm using data up to t minus 1. So y t minus 1 equals gamma 0 minus, sorry, plus gamma 1 x1 t minus 1 plus gamma 2 x2 t minus one plus uh, I would call an error bt. It's a, do you see it's a very simple OLS regression? Uh, well, in this case, in this linear model, it's a simple OLS regression. So what do you do? You simply run the model. You have the data, you agree? Run this model. Now, uh, first, sorry, sorry. First, you need to check that these ones here are integrated, so are non-stationary data. Once you have checked that these guys are not stationary, you simply run the OLS model. So you do run OLS the simple OLS. And the second stuff is what? How do I know that this is a, that, that this vector here, gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two, represent a co-integration vector? How do I know that? Guys, it, it's not this one here. It's not exactly this regression. What I need to do is I need to move everything to the left. I simply kept the errors. Agree with me or not? So basically what I need to do after that is simply compute the errors. So what is this one? This is the definition of my error, guys. Yes or no? Yes. 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 So this is my error. So what I do with my error? OK, so I build this one. I, I have my error. What I need to do? I need to, in order to, in order to know that my vector that my vector one minus gamma zero minus gamma one minus gamma two is a co-integrating vector. What I need to do is I need to check if Bt is an I zero. That's all, that, that's all exercise, do you agree with me? Now, how do I check if Bt is I zero, guys? How do I check if a series is, uh, is stationary? What, what do I use? We have done that in, um, in ARMA models uh, and BAR models, and Dutch models also. What do I use? Um, an augmented Dickey Fuller. Exactly. I use ADF. OK, there are some more corrections, guys, that we, we don't have time to, to do, but there are all models. But at least the ADF does the, does the work. Okay? I need to check. I need to do the ADF. Okay? And I, we're going to do an exercise very quickly, just to show you in English how easy is how easy this is. Now, if you satisfy that if this BT is a stationary number, right? So this implies that this vector here is a co-integrating vector. 
And if this is a co-integrating vector here, guys, this implies that this part here is a nice zero, do you agree? So this implies that I can use my vector error, sorry, my error correction model. So running this model is correct. So you can now interpret beta one, beta two, beta three, gamma, etc., And then you can do forecasting, et cetera. Make sense to you? Yes. Okay, perfect. Now, what is that the issue with this model? So by the way, guys, this, this model is called the Engel-Granger two-step to a step model. Uh, this model here, these steps here, are called uh, two step angle grander model. Okay. So, what is the issue with this model? What problem do you see with this model? Okay, I will rewrite here the model. Y t equals gamma zero plus gamma one x one t plus gamma two x two t plus my error bt. So what is the problem with this model, guys? There is a rule, okay? There is a rule. If you have g r represents the number of variables and r represents the number of co-integrating vectors, There is a rule, guys, that R must be smaller or equal than G minus one. Okay, so the number of co-integrating relationships, guys, is going to be equal to the number of variables you include in your regression minus one. So in this example, how many variables do I have? One, two, and three. Do you agree? Guys, you agree? Guys? Yes. yes. So R can be what is the maximum number of contribution relationships that I can get? Three minus one. So R is going to be less or equal than two. So it can be zero, no contribution relationship, can be one or can be two. Now, take a look to this regression. How many co-integration relationships we can find at a maximum? One. One. Guys, come on, this is an OLS. If you run 10 times the OLS, do you think that gamma zero, gamma one, and gamma two are going to change because you simply run 10 times? Nope. Nope. So unfortunately, guys, with this model here, the maximum number of co-integration relationships is going to be one. So, oops, how do I obtain two then? You see, that's the issue. The problem with the angle granger, guys, is that if you find zero, zero or one, it doesn't mean that this is the maximum co-integration relationship that you can have. You can have more, but the, but, the, the, but the OLS model is not allowing you to do that. It's, it's impossible to find using this model. So that's why, guys, what we need to do is we need to go to multivariate version of this model, okay? So let's, let's do the multivariate version of this one here. Okay, what, it, what it's going to be called, guys, Beck. This error correction model is the one that we have been seeing up to now. And Beck is simply vector, vector error correction model. So it's a multivariate version of what we, what we have already explained in, in, in a minute. Okay, so how this works. So imagine, guys, again, assume that uh, yt, uh, xt, x1t. Yeah, let's do only with, with one, okay? Just to, to make it fast. These guys are I1. Is it possible for me to write, can I do this bar too? So Y1T, X1T equals alpha zero, alpha one, plus beta one, one, beta one, two, beta two, one, beta two, two, that multiplies x1 t minus one, x1 t minus one, plus, uh, let's call it gamma one one, gamma one two, gamma one three, uh, oh, sorry, two one, and gamma two two. This is a, a var two, right, guys? Y1 t minus two, x1 t minus two, plus my errors. 
Do you agree with me, guys? This is a VAR too, yes or not? Yes, it, this is a VAR too. Now, is this correct? Can I do a VAR too on this model here? If I simply do the VAR model that we have been working uh, during the last couple of classes, guys, can I, can I do that? Is this correct? What is the main condition for VAR models? Stationarity. Stationarity, guys. So if I do this stuff and I know that these guys are non-stationary, so okay, remember this is non-stationary. So what I will get is whatever. The model is not prepared for doing that. Now, how do I solve my VAR model? Well, if I want to work with this data and I know that I need the stationarity, what I need to do is I can transform these ones into changes, do you agree? I can take the difference of Y, I can take the difference of X. Agree with me or not, guys? Yes or not? Yes. Yes, so this VAR2 is wrong because we are using I want models, non-stationary data. Sorry, no models, non-stationary data. So what we need to do is I can transform this bar to make this bar coherent. I can do this bar. Simply I can transform this one. I, I simply take the, the lags, the differences of, of any of these guys. And then my, my model can be, okay, I will use the same, the same coefficients. Yeah, sorry, it's going to be change t minus one. I'm forgetting the one, okay? I'm just using. Now, is this model okay? This bar is correct? Guys, is this bar, this one here, the, the lower one, is correct? Yes. So this is correct. Because changes on yt is an I zero, and change on xt, x1t, is also I zero. So I'm satisfying the, the main condition of bar models. So we are okay, we can run this one. Now, what is the issue with this one here, guys? What is the problem with this model? What is the problem, guys? What was the problem using differences? The long-term doesn't exist. Exactly, long-term does not exist. So this is a pure representation of short-term relationships. That's all. Right? There is no long-term relationship in this model. So how do we do, how do we include long-term relationships? Well, I, I will write the model now. This is a this is a vector, okay? So this is a, a g times one. So I can have a, I have several several, so it's y1, y2, y3, etc. So it's a, a g times one. So we have g vectors. So instead of two, I can have g. This is going to be equal to, let's call alpha. Uh, just forget about the alpha, just to make it easier. What I will do is, this one. what I will do is I will say gamma one, change on y t minus one, okay? So this is my vector of, of, of um, sorry, my matrix of coefficients. So this is going to be a g times g, correct? It's like that, it's this one here. If I have two variables, this is going to be a two by two. And then I, I simply start doing gamma two, change on y t minus two, plus, plus gamma, k minus one, change on y t minus k minus one. And what I will add guys is a pi, a vector pi that multiplies y t minus k. Okay. 
G, so all, all of them, all of these guys are matrices. Now, do you see the difference here in this model? So up to up to this part here, guys, what is the name of the model? Up to this part here is what? Guys, what is the model? Guys, you haven't watched my videos. You need to watch them. Up to here is, is called what? Bar. Bar what? What is the number that goes here? G. No? Oh, no. You remember, the this is going to be a G variate. So the G is simply bivariate, trivariate, G variate. But the number that goes here represents what? The number of lags. How many lags do I have up to here? K. K minus one. Right. OK. So this is a bar K minus one. Simply that. Now, what is this part here? Looks familiar to you. I don't have a difference here. This is variable 11. So this is my error correction. Do you agree with me or not, guys? So this one here is the equivalent. Of, what is my error correction model? It's the equivalent of this part here. Yes or not? Guys, do you see the equivalence or not? Guys? Yes. OK. So basically, guys, that's the, the definition of a back model. OK. Now, remember in the previous case, I told you that the, the main problem with these errors, not the main problem, the main challenge with these problems, with these error correction, vector error correction models, is to check if this one is if this part here is co-integrated. Do you agree? If this part here is I0. Got it? So how do we do that? Well, in order to test co-integration, all our efforts, guys is going to be focused on pi, on, on this matrix that is a G by G, okay? And the test for co-integration is, is called Johansson. Co-integration test Johansson. So now very briefly guys, what Johansson does is simply takes a look to the rank of pi, okay? And what is interesting guys is how do you define the rank in terms of eigenvalues? So the rank, guys, is simply the number of eigenvalues that are different from zero. Okay. So if I have a, a matrix that's a three by three, and then you have three eigenvalues different from zero, so the rank is three. Right. What is interesting also, and, and that's what he showed, is if the rank is here of rank of pi equals zero. This means no co-integration, no co-integration vectors. If the rank of pi is equal to G, so that, because remember this is a G by G equals to G, so we have already an I0 series. So I don't need to do all this mess because the series are already I0. So I simply use bar model in the, in the level, in the series and levels. And if the rank of pi is between one and g minus one, then we have co-integration vectors, co-integration relationships of vectors. Okay, so that's, that's all the trick. So what we are gonna look is to the rank of the matrix and try to see how many of the lambdas are significantly different from zero. And then we simply check if there are co-integration relationships. Now, uh, what he does is he analyzes the lambdas. Lambdas are, are going to be called my, my eigenvalue. 
we're going to see this. I will give you more details in, in interviews. So what he does is simply he ranks the lambdas, OK, in, in this order. And then what he tries to do, guys, is he tries to, to find those that are significantly different from zero. But instead of using lambdas alone, what he uses is a, is a transformation. He uses ln of 1 minus lambda. What happens here? When lambda is very close to 1, remember lambda is, is, uh, is limited between 0 and 1. Okay? This is standardized between 0 and 1. So what happens when lambda equals 1? So this number is going to be ln of 0, right? If, if this number is 1, what is going to happen? ln of 0 is going to be infinite, a very, very negative. So if lambda equals or is approximated equal to 1, what happens with ln 1 minus lambda is a very, very large negative number. Correct? Now, what happens when lambda, oh, sorry, what happens when lambda equals 0? Or very close to 0. So what we are going to get here is ln of 1 equals 0. Do you agree? So it, it makes a case. So instead of using, guys, the, the this increases the power of the test, guys. This, this uh, transformation of variable simply increases the power of the test. And based on these two guys, he creates a couple of tests that we're going to see in a, in a couple of minutes. So he creates something that is called the trace test. Um, Professor, can you just go back to the last one for a quick second? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, one minute to copy, guys. Copy. If you want to. Thank you. Pleasure. Okay. 30 more seconds so we can continue. Okay. The, the trace test. What he does is basically, we're going to call it a gamma R trace. And this is going to be equal to minus T. This is equal. So the test is going to be minus T, sum of I equal R plus one uh, to G of ln of one minus gamma I. Okay, this is a trace test. And the null hypothesis, guys, is always going to be the following. is R equals zero versus R is larger than zero. I'm sorry. Versus R is larger than zero, but it's smaller or equal than G. The next hypothesis is going to be R equals one versus R is larger than one, but it's smaller than G, etc. Right? So this is my trace, trace test. We're going to see that in a minute. And the maximum likelihood the maximum likelihood test, guys, very similar to this one here. But it computes one at a time. So this is going to be minus t times ln 1 minus gamma r plus 1. So on the null hypothesis here is the same, is r equals zero versus r equals one. The next one is going to be r equals one versus r equals two, et cetera. Okay, so this is the, the maximum likelihood test. We're almost there, guys. You know? 10 more minutes and then we're done with here and then we go to, to EVUS to show you how this works in a very easy way. Okay, so remember the goal here is to find a way in which we can say, you know what, this last part of the equation, this part here with the pi is I zero. If this part here is I zero, then we are sure that all our regression can be used using the, 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 bar, the bar technique, you agree? Because everything is I zero, I zero, I zero, I zero. So this is simply an augmented bar. It's a modified bar, that's it, it's very simple. The technique or the, the bar is exactly the same, but now it's called back because it has, this component in levels. Okay, so there is one additional part that you need to remember because that's the way the data is presented. 
if I just focus guys on pi uh, yt minus k, okay? So this pi in general is written like beta, uh, alpha beta prime. So this is g times r, and this one is going to be r times g, okay? So you decompose, so you, you, you find a way on, on expressing pi as alpha times beta. And remember, this is g times g. So at the end of the day, alpha beta prime is also g times. So imagine, let's assume that I have, a, let's assume that I have four variables. Well, let's do three variables easier. Okay. And let's assume that there is one cointegration co relationship. So how do I represent that? Well, if I have that, what I have is alpha one one, alpha one two, alpha one three. So I have only three variables that multiplies beta one one, beta one two, beta one three. And this multiplies y one, y two, y three all of them t minus k. Okay. So if we take a look, so if you multiply, remember this is a three times one, this is a one times three. So if you multiply this one, you, you obtain a three by three and the three by three is, is this pi, okay? But I'm assuming that I have only a one cointegration vector. So I will just take the first column of this one here. So I will do alpha one one that multiplies beta one one y one plus beta one two y two plus beta one three y three, all of this t minus k. Okay? And now that the final thing that normally we, we do in, in econometrics is we, we normalize by beta one. So this is going to always be one. In order to be one, the other ones are going to be simply divided by beta one one y two plus beta one three beta one one y three t minus k. So this is the way we're going to to, to see the results in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Okay, so this one here, th this part here is what is called the cointegration relationship, the cointegration vector. This part here, these alphas, all these alphas are called adjustment parameters. Okay, and this is what we're gonna see in, in a couple of minutes, guys. When you, once we do e-views, this is going to be much clearer for you. I'm pretty sure about that. Okay, so. Let's start with the views. Any questions? I'm pretty sure, guys, also that once you review this again and once you, you watch this video again, after we have seen the views, it's going to be much clearer in your mind. But questions at this point, high level questions. Professor, did you ever send us the eView files for today's class or are we using yes. the No, 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 I sent you already. Uh, I don't know, perhaps Monday, perhaps yesterday, I think. Uh, let me let me show you first the, the views. Let me open the eviews file. Yeah, let me share this eviews file with you. Yeah, the name of the eviews file, guys, is PPP Coin Correct. The 2021 I just added yesterday. I was checking this one. I did a couple of things. I, I sent you this yesterday, or perhaps on on the weekend, guys. I'm not sure, but you have received this one here. Can you please verify and open the file? Yeah, we got it. It's, it was on Sunday, I think. Sunday. Okay, perfect. Can you please, everyone, open? Let's do this together. Okay. While you open, guys, let me tell you what we're going to do. Have you heard about the PPP theory, guys? Purchasing. Power parity. Have you heard about this theory, guys? Yes. 
Yes, this is one of the most well-known theories in economics, guys, international trade, basically international economics. Uh, what it says is basically there cannot be arbitrage opportunities between countries. So this means the following. If you buy a car in USA and you want to buy a car in Europe, so the prices should be equivalent. Got it? So you cannot buy a car in USA and it's going to be cheaper than buying in Europe. So for you, it's going to be a good strategy to go to USA, buy your car and move it to Europe. Okay, so that's not possible in the long term. In the short term, this can be, these imbalances can be, but what's going to happen is that if the people realize that the prices in USA are cheaper, so they are going to come to USA, buy the products and then bring them to their homes. But the problem is in the USA, as soon as the demand is increasing, what happens? The prices are going to increase. And so you're going to become into equilibrium again. Okay? So that's the basic idea here. So the basic idea here, guys, in, in the purchasing power theory is that this, the, um, the exchange rate at time t should be equal to the prices at time t, local prices at time t, divided by international prices at time t. So uh, this is exchange rate. These are prices, local prices. And this one here, P star is a foreign price of the same good or same basket. Normally that the people don't work with uh, with levels. So what they do is they take the log of this one here. So if I take the LN, so LN of ST is going to be equal to LN of PT, PT star. Okay, so finally, this is called a small ST equals a PT minus so a small pt is ln of pt minus pt like that. So this one here, guys, is simply ln of pt. And this one here is ln of p star t. And what I'm doing way is negative here is because I'm applying the, the law of, of uh, logs, OK? The log of uh, a over b is simply equal to the log of a minus the log of b. Okay. And so this is the equation that we're going to be using. And, and the PPT theory, guys, has been dis discussed and, you know, and tried to prove for almost uh, 60s, perhaps 50 years. Okay. And there, there has been tons of discussions about the PPT. Theoretically, it should work, but empirically, they were not able to, to prove it until back models appear. Okay. Now, uh, for us guys, local prices. So let's do let's let's define something. PT for us is going to be the CPI for Italy. Okay, so IT is Italy. P star T is going to be the CPI for France. So the data guys comes from from long time ago. Here was that the currency was liras, and the currency here was francs. Okay, and we are going to try to prove if the PPT, the PPP theory holds using cointegration analysis. Okay, now the, do you understand? So this is going to be the, the framework of, of analysis we are going to, to develop in a couple of minutes. Let's go to the EBUS file. Everyone has the EBUS file open. Yes, but Professor, you have significantly more uh, content than we do. No, don't worry. Yeah, don't worry about that. You, you're going to see this in a minute. We're, we're going to do this together. So the first thing you need to remember, guys, is that let's take a look to the data. OK, so my data is CPI, CPI Italy, this one here. Let's put this together. Let's put CPI together. CPI Italy together with CPI France. And the exchange rate is X. Okay, so but let's join only CPI France and CPI Italy, do a group and take a look to the graph. So I've done that here. Do you understand what, I, what you need to do? Simply CPI France with CPI Italy open as a group. 
and simply take a look to the to the graph. Oh, I need to change my sample. Uh, yes, change the the sample, guys. When you want to change the sample, simply double click on sample. Arroba all. And so I have all my samples. So my sample comes from 1981 January to 1986 June. Okay, we have 186 observations. So now we can take a look to the graph. You see that? So this is my CPI, uh, France, the blue one, and Italy, the, the orange one. Are they stationary? Just take a look to the graph. No, they are not. Okay, they are clearly not. Now, X, guys, is my exchange rate. Double click, let's do the graph. Is this one in a stationary process? Guys, is X an stationary process? No. No. No, definitely no. Okay, so, and, and indeed guys, uh, you are gonna see this one here, but I will do the, I will show you only how to test stationarity with X, okay? So remember, and you do the same with Italy and France and you, you're gonna realize that these two guys are also I1. So what we do in order to test for stationarity, <clears throat> we go view, <clears throat> unit root, a standard unit root, and let's do levels first. Let's, normally this is a monthly data. So remember we use 12 as a, as a benchmark. So we use uh, 12 lakhs. That, that's what, uh, what is normally, what is consistent and what is correct. So you just click okay. Are you with me? So I'm doing a Daumet Dicky Fuller. This is my ADF test. I'm using levels because I want to, to see if, if this data is I1. And then I simply use 12 because I have monthly data and I, I normally have 12 lakhs, 12, 12 months are represent a year. And then we simply click OK. So the only part that you are interested guys in reading is this part here at this point. So what was the null hypothesis? Well, you have the null hypothesis here. X has a unit root. Then remember the, the ADF, these are my critical values. To the left of that ADF, you reject the null hypothesis. They agree. And to the right of the null of the, of the critical value, you fail to reject. Or if you want, you can use the p-value. This is the prop p-value. So based on the p-value, guys, do you reject or fail to reject? Fail to reject. Fail to reject, do you agree? So remember at the 5% significance level, the p-value is, is much larger than, than 0 0.05, so I fail to reject. What do you fail to reject? That X has a unit root. So basically this means that this is an I1, okay? Now, if we want to check if this is an I1, what do we need to do? We need to take the first difference, do you agree, guys? Guys, do you agree? Technically, in finance, guys, we always have I1s. Not always, but you know, 99% of the time we have I1. But just to be sure, we need to check that indeed is we need to differentiate only once to make this I0. Okay, just to be sure. So how do we do that? Let's let's do this again. View, unit root, standard, and then we take we use you see here, guys. First difference. Just click on first difference. Nothing else changes. Are you with me? Click. What is your conclusion now? The first difference has a unit root, yes or not? Uh, no, it has become an I zero process. Exactly. Do you agree with that or not, guys? Agree. Agree. Yes. And so that's it. So beautiful. And if you do the, the same for Italy and the same for France, you want to find exactly the same. Okay? So the first part of my model of co-integration is, is satisfied. So I have a series of I1, I1, and I1. Okay, so good. Now, what I will do is I will do some history with you guys and show you how this model works. That the first thing that happens in, in, in history this was in the 60s when the, the discussions about this model appeared. 
According to theory, guys, okay, so let's do some history. So according to, to, to pure theory, guys, the model implies the following. ST, if I, pa if I move this model here, everything to the, um, to the left, ET, plus, sorry, yeah, plus P star T. And I will not put zero here, I will put here U. Okay, because in, in real life, we don't expect this to be zero, it's very close to zero, make sense? So this one here, guys, this representation here is called real exchange rate. So what in, in real life, what we believe that theoretically, if we believe that co-integration exists, so what is that? In, in economic terms, in econometric terms, guys, we need to show that this one is I zero, correct? And we need to show that indeed one, the vector one minus one and one is a co-integrating vector, correct? If theory holds as completely theory, my co-integrating vector should be one minus one and one. So what it implies that this one here should, should be I zero. Do you agree with me or not, guys? Yes. Yes, so let's do that. Well, in, in Ebus, this is a very simple stuff. So let's create, uh, how do we call it? Um, real, yeah, can you create this one here? So let me go to the view spreadsheet. So you go generate on top and you just do generate RS equals X minus parenthesis, CPI France minus CPI Italy. So what I'm doing is I'm moving from the right hand side to the left hand side and I'm creating a variable that is called <clears throat> RS. <clears throat> you get these numbers? Yep. Yeah, perfect. So how do you test if the model holds 100% as theory says? If the data holds as a, as a model, what, what do you need to do? Guys, what do you need to do? So we are here. This is what we have done. So what I need to do is I need to create this variable here is called U2 or is called RS. What I need to take uh, to check is if this one is I zero, simply that. Agree or not? <clears throat> yes. Yes. How do you check if this variable that we have just created, <clears throat> that this variable that we have created is I zero? What do we, what do we do? We do the first difference ADF test. No, 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 no. Remember, the first difference is to, to confirm a stationarity of, of a stationarity that is I zero, just in level. So what I need to do is unit root, standard, levels, and, and let's put again 12, because it's 12, and click OK. Make sense to you guys? You understand what I'm doing? So integration is extremely simple. Now, the only thing that we are always going to be testing is, is my are my residuals I zero, yes or no? How do I do that? I simply use augmented equivalent. There are other techniques, guys, to control for error, model errors, but at this point, we don't have time to do that. But this, this, makes, this makes it good. Uh, Professor, very quickly, can you go through the uh, rationale? Why, why don't you do a first difference here? Because I want to show that this is I want. 
that is non-stationary. Oh, okay, got it. Thank so you. My, my idea is to show that it's non-stationary. That the goal is that the, the model, the, the test tells me, no, it is stationary. But my null hypothesis is always going to be is non-stationary. Right? So I want to reject my null hypothesis, basically. Now, based on the results that you have here, guys, is my real exchange stationary? No. No, because alpha, you know, 0 0.95 is completely or is much, much, much larger than 0 0.05, so fail to reject. So my real exchange rate is not uh, stationary. So failing to say that, guys, what we are saying is basically, guys, that this co-integration relationship does not satisfy this one here. So if we use pure theory, uh, PPP does not hold. Done. Proved. Doesn't hold. OK, there were a couple of, of discussions later, guys, in, in time. This, this was in the 60s, more or less. This was the first the first ten years of discussions. Now the second, and then you want to do this. The the second ten years of discussions, guys. Someone said, you know what? Ah, perhaps what is happening is that what we need to test is not sorry, it's not st minus uh, pt plus p p star t. What we need to do is we need to create first a variable that is going to be called ratio. Okay, so let's call this ratio. So what you need to do first is create a ratio. So create this variable, subtract this variable from ST, compute your UT, and verify if this is an I0. Because what you do when you create this one here, guys, what you're doing is reducing the, the, the noise, okay? So, and that was the next 10 years of, of discussion. Okay, show me if PPP holds, if you use this model. Now, as you're gonna see, they were not able to prove that this relationship holds, okay? So what they say at the end is, ah, you know what? We are making a lot of noise. So let's simply compute, let's do a simple regression. Let's do an OLS, where we are going to compute ST. It's going to be, uh, yeah, could be an alpha plus beta one PT uh, plus beta two P star T. I don't need this one here. P two P star T plus my error. So you simply run the OLS and once you run the OLS, save the residuals, so create a variable that is going to be called receipt one equals to the residuals of, of, this, of this regression, and then verify if this one is a nice here. Okay, two minutes to do that, guys, please, very quickly. So for this one here, just create a variable that is called ratio, subtract st minus ratio. So this is your new variable that I call ut. Estimate, uh, check if this is a nice zero. Okay, this is the first one. The second one, you simply run the, 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 the data, a simple OLS model. Forget about the coefficients. You don't, you don't care about the coefficients. Then get the residuals and check if the residuals are nice here. That's it. Okay, let's go ahead, guys. Two minutes to do this.
Ready? Okay, guys. So we are running out more or less out of time. So if we create ratio, so you just generate ratio equals CPI Italy minus CPI France. Okay, so this is my 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 what I call ratio variable. Uh, and I don't know which one is perhaps is this one. Uh, Oh, here we go. Yes, okay. So what I do, guys, is I create, what I create is XC ratio. So I just need to create, sorry, I need, I need to generate another variable. Let's generate another variable, okay? I don't know where I have put this. No. Okay, so let's create, let's generate X ratio, something like that. It's, it's just a name that is going to be equal to X minus ratio. Okay. Uh, and this variable is the one that I, I need to analyze. What you do is you simply do that exact same step, standard unit rule, uh, 12 lakhs, and then you check, okay? You still fail to reject, guys. So the second model, it is still non-stationary, so it is still not satisfying the PPP uh, theory. Make sense to everyone? So what I have done is I have tested this model here. I computed ratio, I subtract X minus the ratio, and then I tested if this was this variable was I0, and it was not I0. So PPT simply doesn't hold also here. Right? Now, if you want to test the second model, well, the third model actually, what we do is I simply run the regression, the simple oil is model guys, X constant CPI Italy, CPI France, simple oil is run the model. You don't care about the, the coefficients, you don't care about all this stuff. But what is interesting guys is that you, what you need to do is you need to create your residuals. So what you do here is we can generate Well, we can call it receipt three, just to, to show you. And this is equal to the receipt. So remember that if you have run this model here, the residuals that appear here as receipt correspond to the residuals of this model, of the model that you have run. Okay? So you create this, this variable here. This is your receipt three. And then from here, you do again the unit root And then again, you're better, but you're not still there. So basically, guys, nothing. Okay, PPT theory does not hold. Also, where is my pen now? Doesn't hold in this scenario. Okay, so then someone started to realize and said, you know, wait a second, how many co-integration relationships we can have here? We can have up to two, right? But what we are getting with a simple OLS model is only one co-integrating vector. 
So how do we find more co-integrating vectors? And then is when Johansen and all, the, all, all these guys started doing the analysis. And then they created the basics for the BEG model. Right? So that, that's, the, that's basically how it worked. Now, Johansen implies that, first of all, we have tested. Johansen, as you want to see, is extremely simple. We have tested, guys. Let me close this one. Let me close this one. We have tested. Uh, we have, we know that, I don't know, where, where are my variables? Well, I can't create them. We know that everyone is an I, I1. Okay, so let me create, where's my X? Here is my X. I will join with uh, Italy and I will put France. Okay, I will open them as a group. So I have all my variables. I know that all the variables are, are I1, correct? And as soon as all the variables are I1, I'm able to, I should be able to apply the, the, the technique, the Johansen method. So basically, where was my integration test? So you go, once you have the three variables, you go view, cointegration test, Johansen cointegration test. Now Johansen guys also have has a number of lags. Okay, so in order to test, you go from one, two, three, etc. So in Johansen guys, you need to also find the you need to use the you need to find the optimal number of lags using the archaic information criteria, etc. Okay, I will just keep one. So this is remember uh, I have four lags. I will just keep it, but remember in, uh, in real life, you need to check the, the KIK and Bayesian information criteria, etc. Okay, so let's click OK. And what is interesting now is we need to understand how this works. Here we go. Yeah. So do you remember we have two tests? We have the, 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 the trace test. And we have the maximum eigenvalue of maximum likelihood test. We have these two tests. The way you read this one here is very simple. Just take a look to the to the eigenvalues. Okay, of course, here apparently this one here is, is different from zero. This can be zero. This one for sure is zero, but very close to zero. And the same happens in here. So these numbers don't change. The that the test statistic is 51, and this is my critical value. So if my critical value is to the right of my, sorry, if my statistic is to the right of my critical value, so you reject the null hypothesis, okay? So what are you rejecting, guys? You are rejecting that we don't have any, uh, that we don't have a cointegration relationship. So this implies that I have more than none. So I, I have one or more, do you agree? So you go to the next, to the next one. You see the, the, the test with a critical value. So now it's to the left. So you fail to reject that you have more than one cointegration relationship. So how many do you have? Well, you have one cointegration relationship. And this is, you know, Ibus is, um, is, is providing you the answer already because it tells you, according to the trace test, you have one cointegration relationship at a 5% level. And also if you do the same down, you can see you have one cointegration at the 5% level using the maximum eigenvalue test. So that's it. So indeed, guys, you, you know, uh, guys from um, the PPP were, were extremely happy because they show that at, at least the PPP should hold, okay? Be because they have a relationship. They have a, a cointegration relationship that holds. So this implies that there is a linear combination of the variables of S, P, uh, exchange, uh, sorry, prices, local prices and foreign prices that are integrated, that are related in a long term. So this implies that a PPP indeed exists in the long term. It's a long term relationship. It's not a short term relationship, but it's a long term relationship. Got it? So once you have proved this one here, guys, so this implies that you are able to use the, the vector error correction model. Okay? So Johansen simply tells you that indeed the vector error correction model that you're going to be working with is correct. And that's what we're going to do. So. Questions about the, the Johansen test? Quick question. 
Even yep. though it says at most two, we have a 0.25 and we only have indicates one co-integration, L is zero. Yes, yeah, it, it moves only, it, it, it stops when you reject the first one. When you fail to it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. okay, guys, so now how do we do? Uh, yeah, I can delete this one. Now, how do we do a var, do you remember? Because now that the technique is like the var, so you do quick, Estimate var, and when you do estimate var, guys, you simply click on a vector error correction model. So again, just to be sure you understand, quick, estimate var, and once once you are in the in the window, you just click here, vector error correction, and then you write exogenous variables. It's going to be x uh, CPI Italy, CPI France, and again, guys, use CPI France. Yes. So again, what's going on? CPI first. Again, the, the number of lags need to be determined properly using the Dakaiki and, and you know, variation information criteria. And, and what you do is, for example, if you do, let's do a couple of them. So let's do a, a back one. Okay, so you run. So these are the results of the back one. You see, it's only one lag. And what you are interested here, guys, is just your, your Akaike and your shorts. Now, if you do the back two, so I, I created this already here. Oh. Yes, I have my variables. Back two, you simply change the, the two here. Okay, just run. And these are the results of a back two. So you have two lags. Take a look to what, what we care at this point is simply take a look to the archaic and, and shorts. Which one is better? A back two or back one? This is back one, this is back two. Which one do you prefer? Guys, which one do you prefer? According to the archaic information criteria. Let's use the, uh, the archaic. Back two, back two is smaller. Exactly. So what you're looking for is that the smallest value, so minus 23.60 is, is smaller than minus 23.58. So the back two is the, is the best model for this part here. Okay, so, and I will use the back two for moving forward. Okay. Once you have the model, guys, you do exactly the same, the same things that you can do when the, um, with, the, um, with bar models. So you have impulse responses, so you can click impulse. So you can you have the, the same graphs as before. You see what is the impact of a, a changes on exchange rate on CPI? So it, it goes up and then decreases significantly later, etc. What is beautiful about this one here, guys? If you increase the number of lags, sorry, the, the number of observations, that number ten instead of 10, 20, 30, 50. So you're gonna see that this goes into equilibrium again because we have an, an stable system. We have a, an stationary system. Even though we use labels that are I1s, everyone is I1, but the complete system becomes in the long term as a kind of a stationary process. So that's the beauty of this model. Okay, you can also, uh, I mean, what you can also do, okay, so let me estimate this again. What you can also do, of course, guys, is forecast. Okay, you simply change the name. If we can do forecast, for example, let's do the, the last six months. 9601 to 9606. And we can call this variable, yeah, it's going to be a suffix F. So it's going to be the name of the variable, CPI Italy F, CPI Italy, CPI France F, etc. And if you run this model here, the, what is gonna happen it will appear something like this one here. This is the, the forecast for France with an F at the end, CPI Italy with an F at the end. So this is the forecast for Italy. And so let's take a look to one forecast, okay? So let's take a look to CPI forecast, CPI Italy forecast with CPI Italy. We click both of them. We do a, open as a group and then we can graph just to take a look to how good the, the forecast is. Oh, yes, we don't want all, we want the sample only is going to be 
996 to 996.06, I think, right? No. So these are, these are the, the last six months that we have forecasted. And here's the forecast, guys. The CPI Italy, guys, is like the orange one, and the CPI forecasted is the blue one. So you can see that we have improved by a lot. If we just have, if we use just the, um, the VAR model, guys, it's going to be a line. The forecast is going to be a line in between. That's all. But when we introduce this type of long-term relationship, you know, that is that at the end of the day has a stationarity condition embedded in that, our forecasts are going to be much, much better, guys. And, and you, you want to see that. Okay, in real life, when you apply the, the co-integration vectors, the co-integration models, back models, you, you want to see that your, your results, your forecasting are much, much better. Okay, questions. So you have all the all the recordings, you have the, all the material. So let's talk a little, I, I need to talk about the, the quizzes. Do you have questions, guys? So let me talk about two things. Okay, so the, the, the quizzes are going to be, guys, Sunday. Uh, what Sunday is this one? Sunday 9 from 12 noon. And you need to return 8 a.m. Monday. Okay, now. You are going to have two quizzes, quiz three and quiz four. Now, each guys, I'm, I'm giving you a lot of time, okay? But indeed, each quiz is prepared for one hour. So in two hours, you, are, you should be more than enough able to solve them. But I give you a lot of time, guys, because what happens, what, what is crucial for me, guys, is what happens on Tuesday 11. What happens on Tuesday 11, guys, we have the final exam. Okay, and the final exam, as you know, is an oral exam. Now, excuse me, professor. Yes. I thought the final was on the 18th. No, no, no. We agree that it's on the 11th because uh, the graduation is on the 18th. It's before uh, the graduation is on the 16th or something like that. We agree on last class that the exam final is going to be the 11th. Yes. Okay. So guys, what happens is that Q, Q3, what, what we have here, so it's one hour each. So Q3 contains basically ARMA PQ plus Garch PQ models. Okay. So this is a model, uh, this is a Q3. And Q4, is going to be basically VAR error correction model plus Beck model. So these, these ones are here. Now, you need to, why I'm giving you a lot of time, guys, because what you study for, for these models here gives you already more than half of what gets, what is going to be considered in the oral, in the oral exam. So if you really study, you study, of course, you need to, the, uh, the quiz, guys, is uh, is not open books. The quiz is like a normal regular quiz. Right? What I want you to to stress yourself is to solve by yourself without your notes. Okay, I will note that in your in your exam. So it's up to you. I'm not going to be looking at you, but if you really want to to learn, do it like that. And how I will realize that indeed, if you if you get a beautiful grade here, a beautiful grade here, and a terrible grade here, so of course I will realize, huh? How is this possible that he gets a beautiful grade here and he's terrible in here, right? So what I'm trying to tell you is a study, okay? These quizzes are, are I take home, that's okay. And remember, you, you, you can eliminate one. However, these tests are going to be evaluated again in, in a couple of days. So after, you know, one day after you present the, the exam. Now, what is the naming convention? So eight in the morning. So you can, if you finish guys at one, two, 3 p.m. on Sunday, please send me the, the, the exams, send me the quizzes, okay? What you need to do, please, you the, the naming conventions is going to be Q3, your surname, 
please, a single document, PDF or Word. Don't send me 10 documents. It's one document, one, one document for Q3 and win one document for Q4. Otherwise, it is a, it, you don't imagine how tricky it is to try to find papers that you send me or pictures that you send me. It is really hard, okay? And then you send this to me 8 a.m. morning, Monday. That's it, questions. So you have all the material, you have all the videos, et cetera, with you until 12 noon on Sunday. So you, you can use them as, as you want for, for the quiz. So Professor, you said quiz three and four should be about 50% of the um, oral, the remaining being the stuff that we did before. Is yeah, that... yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes, that, that's, that's completely right. So that's what I'm saying. If you take Q3 and Q4 quizzes as practice for a final exam, you're going to be much, you're going to be very well. Okay, and I actually stress more on, on so, okay, so let me tell you about the, the exam. Part one, part two, part three, part four. Part one is quiz one, part two is quiz two, quiz three, and quiz four. Now, in terms of weight, I, I weight these ones here, let's say, yeah, I would say 80 to 80 percent. And the weight of this one here is, yeah, let's say 15 percent. So I weight more on, that, on the econometric side. Now, what to study the quizzes, guys. So the quizzes are, you know, I, the, the quizzes are very long. So if you are able to answer the quizzes, you know, in the very, very quickly, very, very quick way, so you're, you're, you're well prepared. Now I'm not. I, I can prepare. I can say. I can tell you guys. Can you please uh, give me an idea? I can write a model here and tell you what, what is the name of this model. Okay. I can present you a, a EBU's results and I can tell you, you know, how, what is this test? Why are we using the white test? So according to the white test, what are you what are you concluding given this table here? So I, I can I can prepare this very quickly now. Uh, the, the exam, guys, I will, I will send you by, by Friday, I will send you on a schedule for the final, for the oral exam. You are going to be, it's, a, it's going to be on a schedule with uh, groups. So the exam is made in groups of four, I think. Okay, and we start at 5 p.m. And we finish, you know, it is per group. I have more or less 20 minutes per group. And uh, there are, four to five questions to each of you. And, and basically it's very quick. So I, I ask you, okay, Kevin, give me the, the assumptions of the OLS. Okay, James, give me, what is the idea of an homoscedasticity? How do you test for heteroscedasticity? You know, Rashad, can you tell me something about autocorrelation? So it's very quick. It's very, very quick. What I, what I want from you guys is that you show me that you really understand that, that the concepts you really have in mind what to do, what are the issues with autocorrelation, what are the issues with the uh, heteroscedasticity, scale, et cetera. So the oral exam is very quick, okay? Uh, and that's it, questions? Uh, yes, I have one. After class. So this oral exam that's for 30% of our grade it's only going to be maybe one to three questions? No, 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 no. You are going to answer four, four to five questions. Every individual answers five to four to five questions. Okay. Right? And most likely it's going to be at least one question per, per point. Part one, two, three, four. Okay. Uh, so professor, when you say this breakdown, like 15% for Q1, is that like, um, no, 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 no. These are not the questions. So more, more, more questions are going to come from, from this part, P2 to P4, than from P1. But the weight is not, no, the weight is, uh, yeah, it's basically the same weight for everyone. But less questions. I will, I will focus more on P2 to P4. But of course, in P1, you need to know. If you have solved the, the quiz, guys, and, and solved it again as an extra credit, you're going to be more than one prepared. There are no tricks here. I, I don't trick the, the people. If you really know what we have done in the quizzes, you are going to be more, more than well prepared. Okay. And professor, I think you stated this, but you said we could drop our uh, lowest grade on the quizzes, right? Yes, exactly that. So from quiz one to four, you, you select one. Uh, well, you don't select. I will simply eliminate the one that is uh, the lowest one. Okay, and would we be able to email you to ask for a quiz two grade? Or... Yeah, we, we have that already. I, I have that. Yes, just email me and, and I will reply you. Okay, thank you, Professor. Pleasure. Okay, guys, so that's it. 
Uh, yes, I'm still, yeah, yeah I still got to talk to you after class. Yes, very quickly because now I have a. Okay, okay, guys. So it was very nice meeting you and teaching you, and hopefully you you have learned something from this class. We need at least four more classes to do this properly, but you know, that's okay. I'm pretty sure that what you have learned here is exactly what the people in the industry is going to start looking for and start asking. So if you answer me, you're going, you, you, you should feel confident of going to the industry, guys, for sure. Okay, questions? Um, one last question, Professor, just to make sure the final exam is going to cover everything we've done so far. Like, everything. Uh, okay, everything. it could be from everything we've studied. Yes, everything, everything. That, okay. This is this part here. This all, is right, this all right, all okay. right, thank you. My pleasure. Okay, guys, so, yes, sir? yes, go ahead. Yeah, we have two extra credits so far, and also I send you my uh, two challenges. Is that all? Yes, that's all. Okay. That's all, Shinji. Okay? Thank you. Excellent. Okay, guys, I simply stay with Kevin, I think, and then we, we stop. See you guys, take care, and see you uh, on, on a week. Okay, I will send you the, the material, all the exams, the quizzes by Sunday noon. So you're gonna have them and you're gonna have a lot of time to, to work with them. Make sense? Okay, see you okay. guys, take care. Upload the video a lot sooner than- Oh, no, no, definitely. I will ask tomorrow tomorrow to be upload to upload this, this video. Okay, right. so you're gonna have time to review and check and everything. So you have up to now, you have everything, but I will, I will definitely ask these guys to do that. Okay. Okay, okay guys, uh, see you soon and take care. Thanks very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.